Um, thank you. And for that, I want to I want to thank um, Greg for having this idea and and making this happen and bringing all these uh, brilliant people together. Um, and and also, Matt, thank you very much for putting this together. Um, Dr. Designatus Munson, um, congratulations uh, on that. Uh, has you know kept us informed and made all this happen and had the forms and everything. And it's been really confidence inspiring. As I know, as I prepare to travel here, like always to know that he was taking care of us and and giving us information. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, what I want to do is give a non-evangelical um, description of um, some work that we're pursuing at the Homer Multitext um, for our own purposes. And this has to do with canonical citation. Um, this is not a proposal for some universal standard. It's really just an idea that we think would be helpful to us. And because in the past we've had one or two ideas that turned out to be sort of helpful to other people too, I thought I'd, I'd share it. Um, the Homer multitext is built on the site architecture. Some of you know all about this and have contributed to it and, um, and used it and others haven't. So I thought I'd start by giving a very brief overview of this. Um, site stands for collections, indices, texts, and extensions. Not necessarily in that order, but that's the order that gives us the cool word site. Um, and it is an architecture that is based on machine actionable canonical citation of text and other data. Um, canonical citation here doesn't mean traditional citation, right? Um, in the ancient Greek and Roman studies, we have canonical schemes of citation for many of our works. You know, the Iliad is cited by book and line. Um, the books of the New Testament cited by chapter and verse. Um, and often these traditional citations work well in the 21st century. But here, canonical citation just means independent of any technology and, and ideally stable, right? So we have um, these relatively concise strings that identify passages of text, and these are the CTS um, URNs, it's the URN notation, which is an internet standard thing. And, um, and in the site architecture, then these citations can resolve to uh, the data to which they point. So I'm assuming things work. Um, so here, this citation, URN tells us it's a URN. CTS, because it's a canonical tech services citation. This is just a namespace. Um, TLG 0012, TLG 001 is, TLG 0012 is um, Homeric Epic. TLG 001 is the Iliad. FU Purse, it's the edition, and this is the Furman University modification of the Perseus text, which in turn is based on Allen's edition. And then we have book one, line one, to book one, line 10 is what I asked for. And if you throw this um, URN at a service that knows how to interpret it, we get these lines of the Iliad back. It's pretty straightforward. And then the trick with CTS URNs is that they do capture the um, semantic structure of a text. And so you have a lot of flexibility. We could ask for book one of the Iliad. We can ask for book one line 600 through book two, line 10, like whatever. And, and it allows us to identify and retrieve passages of text. Um, we can, because, because of working in the digital realm, um, we can extend our scheme of citation when it's helpful beyond the traditional one. So this is a citation to an exemplar of the Furman Perseus text of the Iliad um, that I've tokenized um, into tokens that are significant for the purposes of syntactic annotation. So this is words and punctuation. Ended the citation scheme here, so I can now cite precisely any token that I want to work with for syntactic, um, syntactic analysis. This also lets us do things like retrieve more precisely. So this is really two sentences. Um, who of the gods set the two of them to 
together to fight in strife, um, the son of Leto and Zeus. This is one and a half lines of the Iliad, right? So if we are working with just the traditional citation scheme of the Iliad, we couldn't cite this, this precisely, because we could cite two lines. Um, in this tokenized exemplar, I can cite much more precisely. I can cite the, you know, from book one, line eight, token one, tis, to book one, line nine, token five, which in this case is a semicolon. Um, and, and, and identify precisely what I want to talk about. So CTS URNs give us this. Um, we can do, I mean, I won't take the time to resolve all these. Chris, you, we, just, yes. you just dropped out of the I dropped out of the Google. 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 Yeah. All right. Good. Thank you for the. Uh, okay. I like this infinite, infinite tunnel. Am I back? Yes, you're back. I'm back. Oops, I just un unmuted you after you muted yourself. Okay. All right, and I can screen share again. Come on. I am no longer presenting. Can I, Mike, can I? Hold on, let me present to everyone. I'm presenting to everyone. Maxine, you join? Could you mute yourself? Chris, you also. I'm muted. I'm going to show you. All right, thank you. My screen is sharing this feeling to start. Oh, great. Well, well. There's no session to start screencast with. Maybe we start the browser? No. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> I'm going to close this window. Yeah. Let's see. I'm going to try it again. Am I? Do, do I look like yeah. I'm? Is I going back to business? All right. So, um, CTS URNs identify passages of text. Site URNs identify everything else um, in the world. Uh, they identify objects in collections. And we'll talk about that more in a bit, but we can leave it at that. We've got CTS URNs help us identify as precisely or as imprecisely as we want passages of text. And site URNs let us identify other kinds of data objects um, that we can work with. Um, for these URNs, um, for certain categories of data, we've identified, we've added to the URN citation um, provision for sub-references, which allow us to be even more specific. And this will come up more later. So I'm going to call up another text here. I think this is going to be Herodotus. Um, so this is CTS text. I've asked for Herodotus in this edition. This is also based on the Perseus edition. Um, the first citable um, unit is book one, section zero, which is his little prologue. And I ask for 1.0 to 1.1, and I get this, the opening of Herodotus. Um, in this tool, 
I can um, select within these cit citation units a passage of text and um, create a, an even more precise CTS URM. So this is identifying Herodotus 1.0 from the first instance of the Greek letter alpha, capital alpha with a um, rough reading, through the third instance of IOTA in this passage, right? And so this, this lets us be even more precise. Um, work like that. Likewise, we can do, we have a site URM to an image, and this here is an image of the Venetus A manuscript of the Iliad. We can cite the image, and similarly with sub-references, we can cite a region of interest on the image um, and capture this in a very concise machine actionable citation. And then this, um, with that citation, we can either call up just the, resolve it to just the passage or just the region of interest in the image, or we can see it in its, in its context, right? So we can see a, this will take a minute to just kind of suck it from Houston. Uh, we can see the larger image and, uh, and the region of interest identified on it. This is to say that over, over the years, we've um, developed ways of identifying precisely, as precisely as possible, the data we want to work with um, in a digital environment. Um, and this gives us scholarly quotation, right, which is citation plus reproduction. And as we've done for thousands of years, a good scholarly quotation lets us be very precise about what we're talking about while also giving access to the larger context, right? So you cite Luke chapter 2, verse 1, but so you can talk about chapter 2, verse 1, you know, and the decree coming out from Caesar Augustus. But that, of course, that same citation gives you access to chapter 2 in its entirety, the entirety of the gospel according to Luke, and so forth. So um, we can do that. And this is the basis of how we've always worked, and it's just as useful in the digital realm. And so I want to talk about trying to apply this to graphs, right? So this is an old map of um, the ancient city of Königsberg, which is now Kaliningrad. Um, where Leonard Euler in 1736 pretty much invented the science of, of, graph, uh, of graph theory, right, by solving algorithmically the puzzle of whether it's possible to cross all of the seven bridges um, of Königsberg um, once and only once and end up where you started, right? This is the basis of graph theory. Computer scientists and, and um, biological scientists, that everybody uses use graphs all the time. Humanists use graphs all the time, too, often without really thinking about it, but sometimes thinking about it very specifically. So we saw this yesterday um, in, in the, the work that um, Angelo showed off and, and, of course, the things that um, all the cool stuff that Giuseppe um, was inviting us to, to consider in the near future as part of this project. Um, I got really interested in thinking specifically about graphs after seeing the work that Francesco Mambrini, who is, we're lucky to have him here today, the work he did while he was a fellow at the Center for Hellenic Studies, um, and this terrific, awesome demonstration of how much we can learn, uh, we can stand to learn by applying different graphing approaches to um, works of, of Greek literature and Greek history. And so he gave this incredible presentation showing different kinds of syntactic, tectogrammatic graphs. And I got really excited about this and, and realized that our work in the home multitext could very much profit from this kind of thing. Um, so I want to talk in reference to one specific example from our work on poetry. And it's this bit of the Iliad um, from the beginning of book 24, um, where Achilles is yearning for Patroclus. And we can see, let's look at the, our cool manuscript. It's always fun to look at a manuscript. Um, here we are at the beginning of book, book 24. 
Iliadas Omega, which I'm going to tease me with a gl glimpse of it before going away. Here we go. Um, and the context, while we're waiting for this to show up, is that um, Patroclus is dead at this point. Achilles has taken his revenge and, and chased Hector around and, and killed Hector and killed hundreds of other people and fought the river and everything. And um, it's, it's nighttime and he's tossing and turning in his bed, um, weeping and remembering his, his lost friend. Um, the book opens with this, and of course we're going to have um, Priam come, and it's going to be this very affecting scene between Priam and Achilles. It's taking too long, so I'll skip it. Uh, this is a passage that's subject to analysis um, with a couple of different kinds of graphs. The first and most um, straightforward one is uh, how we work with the Homer multitext and what we used to call digital scholarly editions, a digital scholarly editions graph, or DSE, until we realized that there's nothing particularly digital about it. So we've changed, we didn't want to lose DSE, so now it's documented scholarly editions, um, which is basically a graph that consists of at least three vertices. Um, in our case, we had a couple more. Um, one is a physical text-bearing artifact. Uh, for the Homer multitext, this is a folio of a manuscript. The second vertex of this graph, or node of this graph, is um, documentary evidence for that physical artifact. In our case, it's a digital image of it. And then the third necessary vertex is a, a citable passage of text, um, our edition of the text that appears on a physical object. Um, let's see if this will turn up. It's a little slow. Okay. So this is an implicit visualization of this graph for one folio of the manuscript. Um, there's obviously the physical artifact is in Venice, sitting in the library in Venice, but we do have this digital image and um, each of the colored rectangles is a region of interest identifying a citable passage of text on this graph, on, on, this, on this folio. Um, and this is how we work and we saw, um, again, very similar things from Angelo's excellent presentation um, yesterday. We can realize this graph more ex explicitly, um, and it's something that looks more like a graph. Um, there's something like this, some kind of visualization like this, where um, the little circles are, we have, um, we have different texts, and then in red, we have the specific asserted relationships between these things, right? So. Um, you know, Venetus A, folio 311 recto, has on it um, a passage of text, right? Um, this, this image illustrates the folio and so forth. And so this is, this is the graph. Realize where we have the vertices are objects that we can cite with URNs, and the edges are specific scholarly assertions, right? This text appears on this 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 folio and so forth. So that's good. I lost my thing. I'm away from my presentation. The other, it gets more interesting though when we look at the passage. Um, so this is, these are the lines of the Iliad. No normal human being can possibly read that on the screen, so I'll make it bigger and I will also read it. I'll just give you the English. So these are the lines we're talking about um, that I want to talk about. But Achilles wept remembering his beloved companion, nor did sleep the all-mastering hold him, but he turned this way and that way, yearning for the manliness and noble strength of Patroclus, and all the things he had accomplished with him, and all the pains he suffered, passing through the wars of man and the pain-giving waves, remembering all these things he let fall at great tear, at times lying on his back, at other times again, or like times lying on his side, at other times again on his back, at times on his front. So it's a very vivid poetic illustration of somebody tossing and turning, right, like you do when you can't sleep, um, obsessed with grief. 
this is what these lines look like on the manuscript. And um, the interesting thing here are the little lines um, out on the side. These are the abaloi, right? These are editorial marks on the manuscript, and this is our 10th century scribe preserving the editorial marks that the scholar Aristarchus, um, the Alexandrian scholar Aristarchus used to add semantic information to his edition of the Iliad. These um, abaloi, you know, like the skewers, the shish kebab skewers that like he sticks through the line so he can remove them. Aristarchus indicating that these lines aren't Homeric and don't and probably don't belong in the poem. Aristarchus was responsible. He didn't throw things away, but he said, I kind of I don't like these. So the first question is why? Like why are these four lines um, not considered Homeric? Well, there's a, a, a comment on the manuscript that talks about it. And um, here it is in translated in English. This was translated by Marlowe's Belthausen and Gunnar Hedden, who are two of our Homer Multitext editors, um, both undergraduates. Gunnar um, was a student who had exactly one year of Greek at, at Furman University, and then he went to the CHS in the summer and worked on this manuscript. And, um, Marlowe's is an undergraduate at the University of Leiden, and these two teamed up, and it fell to their lot to transcribe um, and translate this this scullion. So here's what this, the comment says: "I'm yearning for Patroclus." It's that quotation from the Iliad. From this phrase until the line beginning, "Ton mimnes kominos," the lines are athetized because they are cheap. And with them lifted out, the grief of Achilles is made clear more emphatically. But he turned this way and that, at times on his back, etc. And Andra Teta and Menos indicate the same thing, for there is no difference. And Homer never uses Andra Teta for Andreion. Instead, he uses Enoreion. And remembering these things is awkward, because he has said remembering his companion above. And Aristophanes of Byzantium Athetize these lines earlier. So the first part of the scholion is all explaining why Aristarchus didn't like these lines. They're cheap, they're like melodramatic. Um, the vocabulary isn't right for Homer. Um, it repeats the idea of remembering, which is is not the kind of Homeric economy that we expect. Um, and also Aristophanes didn't like those lines either. So it wasn't just Aristarchus who didn't like them. But the scholion goes on. If you don't want to appetize the lines, then either on should qualify everything, that is the main verbs estrepito and eben, or there needs to be explicit punctuation after tokumata peron. Okay, so this is like very complicated, um, and it, it, it takes a lot of thinking to figure out, but uh, what's interesting is this scullion really gives us three different ways to read the poem. Right? The first thing, like Aristarchus didn't get these lines, and the scholiast, the, the commentator, makes it clear that the poem still makes sense if you take those four lines out. Right? It's, it's like you can remove these and still have a coherent passage. It's the first question, right? Well, if you take them out, like does the poem fall, fall to pieces? And it doesn't. Second, it gives two different ways to read the sentence if those lines are present. And the, the last one is almost certainly based on the work of the ancient scholar Nicanor, who wrote a book on how to punctuate the Iliad. And so we assume whenever the scullion talks about punctuation, they're um, paraphrasing the work of Nicanor, which is, which is lost. Um, as prose, that's all very complicated and hard to deal with. It's easier to understand, or can be easier to understand, if we take advantage of the awesome capabilities of tree banking. And so we can express each of these three readings very explicitly in a syntactic graph. So this is what it looks like if we believe Aristarchus and remove those four lines. We end up with a syntactic structure like this. And I don't know how clearly it's showing up on the screen, but you can see up here at the top um, that you know, the, the text that's black is the text that's not, oh heck, I'm doomed, um, come back, all right, 
the text that's black here in the middle is the text that's not actually involved in the syntactic graph, and that's all the stuff, in this case, that Aristarchus um, wanted to wanted to remove. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the syntax here. Um, for one thing, I, uh, it's very likely that people who are really good at tree banking would find things to criticize about my my um, analysis of this, especially things like you know where I've used like aux, aux x and things like that. But um, this is a second view of it, um, as described by by the. Uh, if you don't want to athetize those, either the verb pothion has to govern everything. So we we um, you can see there's this massive coordination of all these verbs with the um, participle pothion yearning um, acting as an adverb and and modifying all of those, or the version according to Nicanor, which where the again the one thing I'll point out is here and on the screen now let's see completely incomprehensible, but at the very top, you see a little punctuation mark, right? That's the punctuation mark that the scolian said you need to add if you're going to read it this way, and it's coordinating the whole thing. So um, I'd be happy to talk syntax with anybody who wants to later. I don't know why. Why we're doing this also. All right. So, I am not. I think this is just giving people a chance to digest what you're saying. Okay, that's, that's good. But, you know, please digest while I try to figure out why I'm not sure it's stop working. Okay. So while you're doing that, just point out what Chris has just demonstrated is how you represent the differences between multiple editions of a work. So when somebody publishes a new edition of a work and they say, so people say, this is great because it makes great use of this thing or this name or that name. What does that mean? Uh, here, you want to go say it uses this name for X times, and it, this differs from that in the edition in the following way syntactically, the choice of vocabulary orthographically, every classifiable logical judgment can be precisely represented in this fashion allowing for new kinds of, of analysis uh, of, of the shape of state of our textual scholarship. So, um, yeah, I finally beat on the computer enough to get started working again. So my, my question for our Homer multi-text work is, is this. We can cite the text with CTS URNs. We can cite our images with site URNs. We can identify physical artifacts um, with, with site URNs. Each of those three graphs of syntax is a scholarly production. I would like to identify those with URNs. I would like to cite those graphs as distinct from the data they organize, right? They all three are organizing the same set of tokens. Um, but the graphs are things, right? Um, I would like to cite each of our DSE graphs explicitly. Um, so how might we do that? Well, okay, the, on one level, it's not that hard. Make up a URN and say this is that graph, right? So here's, it's very simple. Make a site URN, like voila, this is one of those graphs, right? This is Aristarchus's, Aristarchus's reading, and now we can, we can identify that. Um, we could make a collection of graphs, right? So I could call it syntax. Um, and, and cite a collection of graphs and have each of those syntactic graphs um, in the collection. The collection would have a label, like syntax of Iliad 24, um, line 3 through 24, 11, and it could have a description, right? So each of our graphs um, with, with a description. Um, 
and we could associate each of those graphs with the passage of text using a CPS URM. So that's pretty pretty straightforward. Um, the bigger question is how do we resolve citations to graphs, right? Like if I have a citation to a passage of text, I can throw it at a server and get the text back um, in a variety of different formats. I would like to do that with the graphs. And this, this is not where the title Beyond Screenshots comes from because I have observed that when we scholars work with things like syntactic graphs, we tend to email each other screenshots of our computers. And I think if you're emailing around screenshots, there's probably work yet to be done on infrastructure. Um, that's like less than perfectly ideal. Um, and so what I have been working on um, gradually and perhaps accelerating a little bit um, has to do with the E in our site architecture, the extensions. Right. The extensions in site architecture are um, our ability when we have certain categories of data that we want to work with in a special way to, to add to um, our basic ability to cite and resolve things. So for example, with images, right, that are unique to images as a category. We want to see the binary image data. Um, I would like to extend our site architecture with a citable graph extension um, and treat graphs generically um, as a category of data and offer certain capabilities um, for those. I'm going to skip ahead and do this. Um, data model, I'm, I'm not going to do it because I'm running a little bit long. Um, I would like to implement a graph service that might start by having I mean, two obvious requests. First is get graph, where you send in a URM that identifies a graph and you get back um, the graph data in, in some format. And then the other obvious one to me is um, a request is cyclic. Um, you know, graphs, there's no end of different categories of graphs and it's this whole um, enormous um, field of, of research um, and science. But a basic distinction would be between cyclic and acyclic graphs because then you have certain ideas of how you can show it. For example, if we wanted to um, okay so here in the kind of demo version I can see this uh, I have um, in a kind of quick and dirty way uh, implemented a get graph request with a URM that points to some graph data. And I get back this generic expression, and this is the Aristarchan syntax of that Iliad passage, um, as a kind of dumb display, right? Like, oh, I know this is a graph. I know there are vertices and edges. And so I'm just going to apply a generic visualization to it and throw it out here. And I'm not going to go there. Each of, each of these things in, in this is a link to actual data. In the, in the site architecture, right? Because the, the words are citable and, and the relationships are citable. Um, this is probably not anybody's idea of the best way to look at a syntactic graph, um, you know, however cunning it is, and you can like drag it around and stuff, but it's, you know, ugly and stupid. Um, so if we did know that this is an acyclic graph, then at least we know that. Um, that tells us we can display it as a kind of tree, and this gives us a view like we're more accustomed to, to looking at. This is the same data, just where the, the system knows this is an acyclic graph. You can display it like a tree. Um, and uh, in this case, it's using D3, but um, the point of this, you, you could imagine lots of different, um, lots of different ways of visualizing it. Our other ways of citing data let us be precise um, and, and cite, you know, a book of the Iliad, a line of the Iliad, a specific word in the Iliad. Nice to, uh, it would be nice to be able to do that with graphs too. So um, I imagine an extended reference notation. So for example, this first one, 
I'm citing the graph and a particular vertex, identifying a particular vertex in that graph. Um, and that would look something perhaps like this. So here's again our terrible view of the syntax, but the one vertex that I identified in the URN you know, is, is, is highlighted. So it's the context of the graph, and this is the part I'm talking about. This is the part I want to call your attention to. You know, this is the part that's wrong, or this is the part that I disagree with, or this is the part about Achilles. Um, I want to identify Achilles and his companion um, in my... So this one, so I'm getting too many windows over there. Um, it's Achilles. Okay, so here I have identified two vertices in the graph. This is Achilles and his companion. You can see them highlighted in red here. Um, I'm interested in all the adverbial relationships in that, in that graph of syntax. So here, with a URN, I've specified a number of edges on the graph. Right? I have a URN citation that's calling out just the edges that represent adverbial relationships in this. And again, these is, like none of these is an ideal visualization, but that's okay, because it's generic. Um, we could, let's look at our adverbs. You know, perhaps we want to see all the adverbial relationships in this slightly better tree. So this is all precisely identified with the URN. Um, Uh, I can imagine some other other um, useful requests that you could throw. Get graph, get object is cyclic. Um, common vertices, give it two URNs and have the service report which um, objects they share are present in both of them. That might be useful. Find in graphs, get that graphs, a variety of things. You can imagine what would be useful. Um, paths between things, it's subgraphs. So. What was it that Achilles did? Um, well here I have a, a path between um, this vertex and, and this vertex, which actually identifies the subgraph that's kind of the main, the main verbal idea of, of, this, of this science. I think something like this could be broadly useful and could help us humanists work more productively and perhaps more creatively with the stuff we're doing anyway. If it were a little bit easier to share um, the kinds of graphs that we're all making all the time, um, that humanists are making, biologists certainly do this, do this all the time. Um, I've, I've had a lot of fun working with students on mythological genealogies. Uh, those are often not cyclic graphs. Um, manuscript stemata, um, you know, all kinds of opportunities for doing this. Treating these graphs generically um, would let us uh, develop and share visualizations that are a lot easier now. And this is like the scientists who work in LaTeX all day, they, they don't even think about this, but there's an enormous learning curve for any kind of graph visualization stuff, whether you're doing, you know, dot format in, in, um, in graph viz or crazy stuff in LaTeX or D3, um, the awesomely powerful but completely incomprehensible um, D3 JavaScript library. Like these things are hard. And by treating graphs generically in a service, like maybe you know, we wouldn't have to relearn how to do all this every single time we want to show anything. Um, I think an approach like this would be scalable. Right, URN is just a list of URNs in comma-separated values format. Um, is the storage mechanism I've been working with. Um, this this scales very nicely. Uh, treating graphs generically, of course, wouldn't preclude or wouldn't replace treating them specifically. Right, so for syntax, you're still going to want syntax-specific tools and visualizations, um, as as ever. And I'm also not proposing any sort of sophisticated graph theory thing, right? Like everything that's hard or impossible with graphs will remain hard and impossible even if we can cite graphs canonically, right? Um, unfortunately, a lot of the things we want to do with um, linguistic graphs 
are, are the very things that are almost impossible to do computationally, these NP complete problems, um, minimum spanning tree, subgraph isomorphism. These things are going to remain impossible, but um, that's okay as long as we can cite new things. So this year, just to wrap up, what I've been, um, I've got a little library that I'm working on. I'm working in the Scala language because it seems well suited for this. I'm trying to build out a, a generic data model um, wor working in this. Uh, letting the, li the Scala graph library do actually all the work. You know, the, the library written by actual computer scientists who know what they're doing will do all the work. And I'm just trying to add a citation layer on top of that. And the idea is to keep this um, generic and cleanly separated enough so that, you know, we could possibly take advantage of, of things like the Apache Spark, um, you know, if, if, if we get a lot of data on big distributed things. Um, and um, the last sort of broader impact thing, I've, um, I've been sharing these ideas with uh, Gabe Weaver, who is a former Homer Multitext editor, is a classics undergraduate at Holy Cross, who's now a computer scientist in Illinois, and, um, and he's got me involved with this project, the U.S. Department of Energy project for securing the U.S. power grid. And if you think we humanists have problems citing our data, like you'd be horrified to see what, uh, what the um, electrical power people are using to describe the, what is the very lifeblood of civilization. Um, basically note cards from the 1970s um, with stuff typed on them. And so they, they are also looking for a similar approach. So I think this um, might have some leverage there. And that's good. Thank you for listening to, uh, to my, my thoughts. I'll be happy to talk with anybody about these later. Thank you.